G'day folks, you have entered the Ramblatron on a chilly Tuesday afternoon. It is, uh, I think it's about 6 degrees outside. I just stuck a the thermocouple out through the top of the shed there and it's slowly coming down. It's about 8.4 at the moment <laughs> and dropping. Um, yeah, it's a wee bit cold, not too bad. I mean, I know a lot of people are in colder areas, but yeah, it's cold for us and I'm walking to work tomorrow because I've got to pick the RAV4 up. Um, which is a good thing, because it's done. Uh, before we get to that, uh, first thing. Having problems with YouTube going full screen on widescreen videos. It just, the inside PC running Windows 7 is fine, but these two here just won't do it. It just, yeah, I get this black box around the outside. The controls for YouTube are still down the bottom, so if I try and click that, I can't, can't go out of it. Now I've upset it even more, but if I go down to the bo bottom corner of the screen down there, I can actually control it. And that's pushing the play button, so there's a weird graphic glitch in uh, Flash or whatever that, whatever YouTube uses. Uh, if anyone knows how to fix it, please let me know, because I've tried updating everything and it just seems to make things worse. Um, anyway. What else have we got? Yeah, the RAV4 is done. Um, they found the problem with the clutch not disengaging was just pedal adjustment. They had to play with it a bit more and they got that right. So no uh, new master or slave needed. It was working quite well anyway. Which I suspect, I realised anyway, because if the master or slave cylinder was leaking internally, the clutch would just slowly re-engage on its own. It wouldn't have been working right since the day I got it or... I would have noticed something like that starting to happen because the um, fluid blowing past would allow the clutch to re-engage on its own. It would be this, the same as having a ruptured line, it would just start leaking out and dropping pressure. So that was easy enough and then they found it couldn't, wouldn't go out of diff lock. So that took about a week to sort out. Um, thankfully I didn't have to pay for it because it was a problem that they'd um, created taking the box out. Uh, apparently pulling on or doing something with the uh, disconnecting the um, diff lock governor and like modulator which is vacuum and electrically um, operated and I kind of disconnected a pin which goes to the diff lock pin that, go that actually locks the diff center and that was just floating free so the diff lock pin was engaged and even though you push the button it was saying no no it's engaged it's engaged and it wouldn't disengage so they finally found that and I've got it back now well, which is at work in the car park at work at the moment, but um, yeah, much nicer to drive. Clutch is very nice to work with. Uh, yeah, couldn't be happier. Bill was $1,200, including uh, reboot and regrease the uh, front drive shafts because the boots were starting to crack. Uh, that was 200 bucks, and he stuck to the quoted price of a grand to do the clutch, which is really nice of him. Um, well, the clutch kit was 350, so the rest was just labour, which is understandable because it's a bear of a job. I know um, people are asking why, why didn't I pay Brad that much to do it because he might need the money. Uh, basically, Brad didn't want to do it. He was glad that he didn't have to do it. So, yeah, I can't blame him. I've, I know some people say these are really easy, and even one of my friends in the states wants to come out, wanted to come over and do it for me, but nah, I don't know how you do it, man. I really don't seeing what they went through and uh, hearing what Brad was saying about a full day, full two, um, at least a day job with a friend helping. Yeah, I can understand because you've got to disconnect a fair bit of drivetrain there. But this, these people specialise in t tricky jobs. They've got hoists, transmission jacks, everything, and they do it regularly. It was just this odd one which had them caught out a couple of times, but um, normally they go a lot easier, but... No, he didn't charge me extra for it, so that's really, really good. I'll be going back to him for sure. Uh, anyway, that's sorted. Um, you're probably wondering what's flicking over on the screen there, and I was just trying to find info on a machine that I'm getting by um, Battenfeld. It's an old machine. It's an overmolder. Now, they've got plenty of images and things of injection molders and references to them. I mean, this is stuff that I almost qualified on. I do have a certificate of competency up there which does um, state that I'm competent and um, trained in operating, starting and whatever with uh, injection moulding machinery and quality control, that sort of stuff. I did start to do, do an apprenticeship actually 
um, which is part of my previous job. I was working for a small injection moulding company and uh, started an apprenticeship but unfortunately ran out of work halfway through. Um, so getting this machine is kind of uh, interesting because I can see exactly how they work by taking it apart piece by piece. And uh, I was just trying to find photos of it but I couldn't really. It's basically like this but standing on its end and the whole the hunt which contains the barrel, the screw, the nozzle and everything moves up and down with the um, moving platen, I believe. I haven't looked at it yet. It's been ages since I even saw it working. But I believe all that moves up and down to close the die and inject material. And you might be wondering what an overmolder sim doesn't simply mean that it's with the screw and the barrel above the, um, the fixed platen. Overmolding is actually what creates things like your electrical plugs. That is an overmolded plug. So are all your power plugs, or most of them anyway. If they're a screwed together clamshell or clipped together clamshell plug, they're not. They're injection molded in pieces and assembled. But things like that, that's overmolded. That's a um, DVI to analog uh, video connector. They just press these screws in while it's warm and um, screw them in and it's done. All the uh, wires and things are in their own little substrate that gets set in the die. Die closes around it and injects material. I'll go into detail when I get the rest of the machine here. I'm going to have to break it up into, I think, three pieces. The top unit, which consists of the hunt with, and the barrel, all that stuff, all the moving parts, the mixing, um, the hopper and all that stuff will come off as one piece, along with the uh, platens, tie bars, all that stuff will come off as one section. And then there'll be a control box, which is the base, and it will, um, that has all the electrical gear, the hydraulic pump, tank, all that stuff in it. And yeah, lots of hydraulics. Lots of hoses that still are still good. Loads of fittings, another pump, another motor. Um, control panels, like cabinets of control panel, control gear. I think there's a touch screen display on it or an old analog CRT or something. Yeah, really good. Can't wait. It weighs two tons, roughly 4,000 pounds. So I've got to break it into several pieces before I can trailer it home. It's small enough that its footprint would fit on my 6x4 trailer. Uh, but it weighs twice as much as what my 6x4 can handle. So we'll get more detail on that when I get photos. Yeah, that's how cold it is out there. It's slowly dropping. Yeah, 7.4. It's just gone dark, so that will just keep dropping till it gets to about 5 or 6 at the lowest. I think 5 tonight, they're estimating. Where I am, probably colder. Uh, yeah, it's actually dropping quite quick. Now that the um, sun is completely gone, there's no no uh, infrared out there. That is just ticking down like a clock. Anyway, um, yeah, so we've got a nice big machine. We can pull the whole thing to bits and can show you how the barrel works and the way it mixes material and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, they've got small machines. That. I know this is the uh, Battenfeld's material, but they'll uh, they'll be getting a full autopsy on one of their previous machines to look at anyway. Um, yeah, so like you just imagine that on its end, standing on top of the control cabinet. So platens and barrel and everything come off as one unit. Even take the the barrel or hunt assembly, as you call it, off as another separate unit, and then maybe pull the motor out and all that sort of stuff, just to lighten it up enough that I can uh, put it on my trailer and then wheel the trailer under the gantry and hoist it off. I would actually like to fire it up. I'll have a look at how big the hydraulic pump motor is and if I've got that unit running at the same time I might just be able to supplement the three-phase pump for my pump and just run all the control gear on uh, 220. Because most of the time it's one phase to neutral and all the control gear is 240 volts. Sometimes even they've got a big step-down transformer in there it's all 110. Like if it's made by uh, Cincinnati or someone like that in the States, most of it's 110 and you just have a giant step-down transformer behind the machine. Uh, a lot of Chinese stuff was like that. You have a step-down transformer the size of a fridge and it supplies 223 phase to it and 110 to neutral. But anyway, that's enough on that one. This thing here, I milled the key slot in the shaft today, so that's a good step forward. Um, I've got to get some 3.8 key steel, I'll just mill down a bit of 10 millimeter. Um, that's not hard, that's easy enough. I just didn't have time. By the time you go get your lunch, 
have your lunch. You've only got about 15 minutes left, so I managed to get the key slot done, which is good. Um, yeah, so that'll work quite well, and I want to double bearing it. This is going to fit over here like a bell housing, and I'm going to mill down or turn down the rest of the shaft so that I can uh, just have an extra bearing in there, giving a little, little bit more support. Um, yeah, there's just enough material to do it. I suppose any, any bearing is better than nothing, so yeah, I'll just have to buy one. And that's good because I've got plenty of budget left over from the RAV4. I can go out and buy some bearings and other necessity parts. Um, I've ordered a thermo, another thermo controller for this. I have two thermo controllers. The dodgy really high temp one and it's just a generic um, cheapo $25. And I think it's also high temp. I think it's also 1600 degrees Celsius. But the thermo couples aren't, well, I think they're fairly cheap. There are some EGT thermo couples that I might pick up. They're a little right angle with a nut and a gland, and you use them to screw into uh, exhaust manifolds or um, turbo jet housings, like proper jet engine housings. Uh, they're about $25 each, but they go up to really high temperatures. So monitoring EGT on pretty much anything will be set once I've got this control gear. It's not just applying to this. I mean, this thing could blow up on the first run because God knows how rough it is. It's been left out in the weather for so long. It's pretty much scrap. But even if that blows up, turbos are everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but they're not hard to get if you know who to talk to. And uh, I could also use this pump to supplement other things anyway. Um, yeah, that's about it. Got a bit more machining to do on that before I can couple it up to the Yanmar. Um that's pretty right to go. I've got to make a drive coupling to go onto the flywheel whether it's a flex disc that takes up the old clutch holes or whether I drill and tap new holes in it. I might be able to machine a uh, spigot and drill and tap a little bit further out here. Even in the centre here, maybe four small holes and a couple of dowel pins. I'm not sure. I don't know how thick that flywheel is so I've almost got to take it off and just make sure I'm not compromising its strength. Not that there's much thickness in this centre part here on the, the boss. Those bolts are really close together. So, yeah. It's not taking any side load. If it was taking side load, I'd actually be concerned about those bolts because that centre thickness is only about that much. And if I put a, um, a drive plate with a four-belt V-belt V belt system on it, well, I'd probably end up ripping it off one day. It wouldn't be immediate, but it would be catastrophic someday. So... Yeah, I'm not using um, drive belts on it. I know they do work, but it just adds extra expense, extra parts. V belts are lossy anyway, you lose power through them. Not so ideal. It's just axially driven, it's just going to be long. It'll be about this long. And maybe a bit out the side for a, um, a better radiator, I don't know. Or an oil cooler. That's the other option, run an oil cooler. Yeah, lots to do. It's all fun. And I've got room to do it now and still working on more. Now I'm getting this Battenfeld machine, I'll be able to, um, well, I have an excuse to throw out more stuff. <laughs> That's the best part. It's a good excuse to throw out lots more stuff and reshuffle the whole shop, even move that over there for the time being and put all the engines out in the uh, carport because I want to be able to get the base of the uh, overmolder in here at least or the hunt assembly and stuff and have to be able to get power to the heat bands, melt whatever material is left in the barrel, which is PVC, and uh, pull the screw out while it's hot. I don't think I'd be able to get the screw out now that once it's cold. And it's been cold for a long time, so that old PVC is going to be a pain. I've almost got to run, run the screw and actually run it properly with some polypropylene and OMO or something like that, or just polypropylene or polyethylene. I'll get some granular polyethylene and... Um, just purge out all the PVC, just run it, run it, run it until it comes out clean and that way the, the hardened, nasty, clumpy PVC won't be a problem because PVC goes really hard after it's been melted and then remelted again. We've tried recycling it at work, like granulating it and it goes really hard and inconsistent. It plugs the outlet filter on the extruder. It's just, it's not very nice stuff. PVC is not very nice stuff. So yeah, there's an example of an overmolded plug. That's basically what they do. It's an overmolded plastic plug, and that's what the overmolded does. You'd lay that pin assembly with its white substrate in the die, 
and the diode close up around it and inject material. You can see there, that's a gate from the uh, sprue, the injection point. So, yeah, there's one. Would we maybe expected two, but no. Nah. Looks like there's just one gate on that die, but it's right there. So the material comes in at several thousand PSI, fills out the die. Um, that end there is one separate piece. You can see there's a join line, and then there's two clamshell pieces that go over the flex cord. So you've got two sections, one section, and the injection nozzle above, and it just pumps material in at ridiculously high pressure. Now it cools very quickly, tool opens, operator removes the cord or a robot removes the cord or something like that. Set a new one in there, close the door, push the button and away you go. So yeah, fun stuff. I wish I had a good use for it otherwise I'd keep it in one piece and well, I can't house it in here because the shed isn't tall enough. I think it'd probably be another foot higher than the shed is when it, once it's all set up with the supply hoses and the hopper feeder and all that stuff on it. It's a pretty tall little unit, and the the hunt and the the um, platens and everything fold down for transport. But again, it's too heavy to transport in one piece. Oh well, plenty. Of, I've been offered plenty of injection molding machines over the years. They're just they're so heavy. <laughs> the best one I could have picked up for like twelve hundred bucks from my old employer. That would have been awesome, but it weighed something like twenty eight tons. It was a 200, 200 ton clamp force. Oh, what was it? A, it was a really old Japanese thing. It had Nixie tubes for its countdown display. It was really awesome, but it was a dinosaur. And it was just had hydraulic leaks galore. Um, the pist main piston seals were leaking, so it was a piston-type clamp. It had a piston about two foot in diameter and about two and a half to three foot stroke length, just to clamp the platen tight again, close the die up tight. Um, yeah, it was an amazing piece of equipment, but yeah, it was leaky, old, nasty stuff. It would have been good for parts, that's about all. Anyway, it's a bumper edition of Ramblo uh, Tuesday. It's a really bumper edition, we've gone on 17 minutes. I hope you enjoyed it, and stay tuned for more, because uh, I've got to reshuffle some priorities. Thanks for watching.